Beltone Hearing Aid Center presents The Drive. Ready, fight! The Drive. Elmore deep, left side three, it's good! From 30 feet, John Elmore! The Drive with Paul Swan. Welcome into the Thursday edition. Your drive begins now here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Coming up this hour, we're going to hear from Rob Cornelius. He's going to give us a preview of the matchup between Marshall and the Bobcats. That's right. Thundering Herd traveling to Athens this weekend to take on Ohio. And we'll hear from the Ohio side of things with Rob Cornelius. Also, we'll hear a little bit from Jared West last night, the Thundering Herd victorious. Over William and Mary, one by 20. Jared West had 11 points in that game. Great defensive effort from him, so we'll get a few minutes from him from last night. Go over that Marshall victory. John Elmore in that game. He breaks uh, another uh, milestone, over 2,000 points for the Thundering Herd. So we got a lot of basketball to get into. But first, last week we left you hanging because, well, the holidays. We're going to try to fix that right now. And... Going by some coworkers I work with here, uh, we can never take off another week again, even if we have to just sit by a speakerphone and do this. Joe Bartle joins us from rotowire.com because, Joe, um, let's be honest, without you weekly, I, I don't think people get this fantasy thing. I, that's exactly true. And you know what? I was going to uh, say this last week, but I guess I could say it now. I didn't think there was uh, more – I was going to say pathetic, but that's not fair – I didn't think there was a more sad team out there right now than the Green Bay Packers, but I think your Cincinnati Bengals might put them to shame this week with Jeff Driscoll starting at QB. This week? Yes, this week. Well, or multiple weeks, I guess you could say. Fair. The last couple weeks, perhaps. Yeah, um, I, I had totally blacked that all out and I was ready to move on, but uh, thanks, thanks, Joe. Uh, I feel much better now. <laughs> I can never, I can never let you do that. That's not fair to you. No, it's not fair for me. I should not have happiness. Why would I want happiness when it comes to the National Football League? Right? <laughs> I feel, I feel like we're having the same conversation in our own heads, especially when I watch the Packers each and every Sunday. I feel the exact same way. Aaron Rodgers should be better than Jeff Driscoll, though. So at least we have that. But uh, yeah, hey, AJ Green might come back. Maybe, maybe there's a chance that he ends up doing a little bit better and helping Driscoll out. That would be nice. But if you are a Andy Dalton owner, if you haven't already, drop him. I think I can. I don't even need you for that advice, Joe. Drop Andy Dalton. Yeah, I think that's a that's a pretty safe assessment to make at this point, considering he's not coming back for the rest of the season. I, I mean, honestly, I feel the same way about Joe Flacco, and he actually could return. Um, but I just think Lamar Jackson has played so much better too. So yeah, I, I definitely Andy Andy Dalton not going to be on your fantasy teams moving forward, especially if you still have earned contention for the playoff spot. All right, here's another piece of advice which uh, somebody who um, is in our office should have asked me to ask you or just ask me. I would have told them. Um, they sat Baker Mayfield last week, and they had Blake Bortles. Ooh, yeah, yeah, that's a brutal one. That's a brutal one. And it's not as, as if Blake Bortles had been playing well even last week. I mean, this is a guy that's been really struggling and. The Jacksonville franchise put a lot on him as the quarterback, and it was pretty frank even in years past that there wasn't going to be a lot that you can anticipate on Blake Bortles. And lo and behold, he had kind of a miraculous run during the playoffs last year, with which essentially gave him a two- or three-year contract that makes it tough for the Jacksonville franchise to really have a quarterback now. And I think maybe this is a different team, a different record, a, a different potential for the AFC South division winner from last year if they would have simply decided not to bring back Blake Bortles. And obviously the Baker Mayfield decision to not start him over Bortles looks bad, but certainly in hindsight after Baker Mayfield did so well and really has done incredibly well, which we had talked about before with that change at offensive coordinator, um, it doesn't surprise me, frankly. I don't think he'll replicate what he did last week at any point the rest of the year, but really he is kind of bordering along must-start territory at the quarterback position, particularly with guys like uh, even Aaron Rodgers, Kirk Cousins, Alex Smith was a potential starter, and of course he's done for the year as well. Those guys have kind of been struggling where you could reasonably question, hey, is Baker Mayfield a must-start at the fantasy quarterback spot? I'll tell you this, the, the guy who sat him is also a Browns fan. <laughs> so he's just, he was just caught up in his own pit of misery, and he just assumed things. I don't, I don't blame that at all. I understand that, particularly uh, this season with the Packers, where I feel like everyone's going to do poorly, and that literally is just – statistically impossible for them to do. But, yeah, I, I get that a little bit. I guess there's a, a bittersweetness watching the Browns just 
do their opponent dirty last week, and yet not having Baker Mayfield in your starting lineup. A little bit of bittersweet there. Yeah, so um, the Browns fan can't even taunt me because I can just pull that out of my magic hat and say, yeah, but you sat Baker Mayfield in your fantasy team. So um, <laughs> start walking, sir. Start walking. We got a lot to talk about. Of course, um, I don't think there's any fantasy value to talk about Denver and Cincinnati unless you have some Denver players. But we've got Thursday Night Football, which is coming up tonight right here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. New Orleans, they're pretty good. And Dallas, they're okay. Uh, What are you seeing from this one tonight? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of an overrating going on right now with the Cowboys. Obviously, what we saw on Thursday uh, well, Thursday afternoon while we were all stuffing our faces with turkey, it was it was a pretty good offensive explosion. But the Cowboys always play well on Thanksgiving. To me, it's one of their only Super Bowls of the year. I say only potentially because maybe somewhere down the road they end up going to a Super Bowl themselves, but it's been about 20 years since we've seen that, so let's not hold our breath. The Thanksgiving games normally are, are showcase games for the Cowboys and the Lions and whoever else that third home team. I always get a little bit hesitant to put too much stock into what we saw on Thursday, because, of course, it's a national primetime matchup. There's a lot of people watching it. That being said, the offense looks different with Amari Cooper, and we figured it might look different. I don't think anyone was upset for the Cowboys acquiring Amari Cooper. I think it was the right decision at the time. I think people were more upset, and I still feel this way, that they probably didn't need to give up their first-round pick to acquire him. Kudos to the Raiders for getting that uh, kind of squeeze out of them. But look at the NFC East division. Uh, the Cowboys are in absolute contention for a playoff spot. And I think the, a large reason is for Amari Cooper. He is a must-start at this point. And I think if fantasy owners drafted him, I would say third, fourth, fifth round in their fantasy drafts this year and saw the production he had to start the season, there's a potential he could have been dropped in at least in an eight- or ten-team league. Kudos to the person that picked him up because they're going to have a fantasy stud the rest of the way. And I think he's the guy I'm kind of most interested in watching in Thursday's matchup. We already know the Kamaras and Michael Thomases and Drew Brees and Zeke Elliott are going to do great. It's if Cooper continues his run of excellence that I'm most curious about. Joining us from RotoWire.com and RotoWire Magazine is Joe Bartle. And of course, we've got some big matchups coming up this weekend. Uh, we're, we're getting to that point where games are going to start uh, soon being played in clusters. Uh, we're not going to see that Thursday night matchup uh, much longer. So uh, a few more days, maybe uh, per week, for folks to plan. What are you seeing, if you're trying to figure this thing out on a week-to-week basis, what are you seeing the next few weeks? Or let's start with this week. Uh, Where should I be looking for if I'm looking for maybe a quick pickup or if I'm looking to maybe not start somebody in a bad situation? Well, let's talk about a quick pickup for a second. I imagine that at least in a 12-team league, Austin Eckler is owned. But certainly in a 10-team league or even an 18-team league format, there's potential for Austin Eckler to be available in free agency. If that's the case, I sure hope to God you picked him up, because even if he doesn't fill in as the same caliber running back as Melvin Gordon, he certainly is going to be the same caliber receiver as Melvin Gordon has been for the Chargers this season. This is a good matchup, despite all the greatness the Steelers' defense has done, getting turnovers and sacks this season. They are susceptible to giving a lot of yards, a lot of checkdowns, and a lot of throws, and I think this is going to be a heck of a, uh, heck of a Sunday night game with Austin Eckler being a prime and important factor for the Chargers, who are still competing for the AFC West division, but at this point kind of look set for that number five seed in the AFC, this might be more important for the Steelers. And I anticipate Austin Eckler is going to be able to maybe not decimate them, but certainly get about 12 to 15 fantasy points for a guy that you probably weren't anticipating getting a bona fide starter. And that's not just this week. There's potential for weeks down the road where Austin Eckler could be a relevant guy. I also have been picking up Justin Jackson in a few of my deeper leagues. I'm not entirely sold that Austin Eckler is going to get the majority of the carries, and frankly, if it gets down to the goal line, I don't know if he's the main target. Now, they have a lot of big receivers. Mike Williams comes to mind. Antonio Gates has caught a few touchdowns in the red zone, but they do like to run the ball or at least throw some short dump-off passes. Maybe Justin Jackson scores a touchdown, and frankly, if you're starting him at a running back two, that's all you're looking for. So if you're waffling between a guy like maybe Doug Martin, who has a lot of competition on that backfield, the running back spot, or Justin Jackson, I feel more confident this week with the Chargers going against the Steelers, needing to score a lot, potentially going to be scoring a lot, as opposed to maybe those secondary options that might be out there in the free agency wire. He's Joe Bartle from Roto-Wire and Roto-Wire Magazine, helping us with our fantasy football. All right, this is going to be a curveball for you. Well, maybe it's not. You've seen these strange situations. So uh, between the last time we spoke... 
Of course, the politics of office fantasy football. I'm sure there have been stories so uh, you could tell. And there were a couple individuals in our office. I'm not going to name names, but it got really vocal, got really loud. Now, nothing that would constitute you're thinking, oh, my, they're going to throw down. But they were really loud about it. Uh, there was a trade situation here where um, somebody offered a couple of players. They, they had some excess players. And they traded for A.J. Green, who was not playing at the time. They are basically saying, all right, I'm going to give up a couple of guys because I've got an excess here. I'm going to get A.J. Green back. There's some value there for me when he comes back. Also, just being helpful to another player who some players, you know how they are. They sign up and then they never touch their team. And then we had a third party who uh, jumped in here and got mad because the commissioner of this league earlier um, – approved a trade early in time for the start of this week's activities. And then that trade got approved again, and it happened to be against uh, that person who uh, was loudly complaining. How do you handle, let me ask you this, how do you handle the interpolitics of being the commissioner of the Office Fantasy Football League and all of that situations? Is it better to maybe get an outside party to come manage some of this stuff? How... How's the best way in your experience to handle all this? Because I was just laughing the entire time. Well, this feels like a two-part question, right? Like the the whole strategy behind trading, particularly in fantasy football, is a fascinating one, and frankly, could make a dissertation last about a hundred pages at this point. And and I've I've heard just about everything when it comes to trades. I'm I'm currently in a league where uh, the guy that's in the top spot for much of the season really got to that point because. He acquired a lot of players really fast that probably weren't the greatest deals for the other side of things. Now, I've always been, when I'm the commissioner, uh, a pro-market kind of person. So that means if you both agree to the trade, you're both adults, it's fine to go through with it, despite the fact that maybe one side is lopsided as opposed to the other. But it does make for a fancy situation now, especially in this league towards the end of the season, where it feels kind of like a moot point. The team is already pretty stacked. It would be a statistical anomaly for anybody else to beat him at this point in the season, and it's kind of it makes for it makes for not such a fun fantasy experience. Now, I'm not positive if this is kind of what's happening with the AJ Green situation, but most people, if they are acquiring AJ Green, they are likely in line for a playoff spot because, of course, he's missed the last two or three weeks, so he wouldn't have been much help if you were in a playoff push. But you acquire AJ Green not for that playoff push, but for when you are in the playoffs, and he could be a difference maker. I think the fact that Andy Dalton is out and Jeff Driscoll is in for the rest of the year might actually be a bit of a bonus uh, for people that weren't hoping A.J. Green would do well because I think it's going to be difficult, especially with the lingering injury, for him to be an effective guy. But that's still a situation where it makes things tough when super teams are created, particularly for the playoff run. Now, uh, interpolitics, commission stuff aside, that's a whole different other animal. And I think it's really difficult sometimes to kind of uh, balance that and transition it. The best thing that I can suggest as a fantasy expert is to just make sure that if you were to parse this out and kind of decide on your own, is this a legitimate thing? Is this a fair thing if it happened to you or if it happened to anybody else in the league? And if you are able to honestly answer that question saying, yes, this is fair, yes, this is, I'd be comfortable with this happening to me, then I think it's more than likely to be an okay situation to occur across the league. It's tough. Responsibility as a commissioner is tough. And um, not that it ruins your fantasy experience, but I think it makes things a bit more important as far as uh, – keeping the fairness and level levelity of the league active and going. So, yeah, there's a responsibility aspect, too, that makes it a little bit difficult and kind of have to manage that as the season goes on. I have a league where I've set up, you can trade, that's fine, and it's got to clear for the next two or three days. And if people are paying attention, they can veto the trade. Just everybody has a, a voice. Hey, wait, wait a minute, this looks lopsided here. Or, hey, you know what, you're, you're getting too good of a deal, we're just going to veto you. But... I haven't had a situation yet where somebody has uh, had a trade vetoed. And is that yeah, the better way to go? Well, certainly in fantasy, I think, uh, well, I was going to say certainly in real life, democracy is a way to go. But I, I sometimes think in fantasy that can be difficult. Every one of the people in your league has a different agenda when they see a trade cross. And I think more often than not, I've seen situations where a perfectly fine and logical trade gets denied because, oh, you know, I don't want to play against this person this week. Or, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to see this team uh, get this player for the rest of the year. And there's a whole different factors and variety of things that influence the person's decision to veto or to accept the trade. And uh, oftentimes I think that gets in the way of maybe this was a logical and smart trade and it makes sense for both sides. And 
just competing viewpoints kind of make that so it doesn't happen. So I've always kind of tried to stray away from situations like that. But more often than not, if it's a fair trade, it's going to go through because I think of 10 people in the league, at least eight have a conscience. They wouldn't, they wouldn't think it's right or wrong to deny or approve a trade based off of what they want as opposed to what the league would be best for. So it works sometimes. It doesn't work all the times. It, it really is a case-by-case basis. Joe Bartle joins us, rotowire.com, rotowire magazine. Let me remind you, if you haven't tried rotowire yet, you need to go to the website right now. All the time, there are deals, specials, offers, and you can sign up. Find out if you like rotowire, and once you get in there, you'll find out there's so much information there that you're going to have to keep your subscription to parse it all. That's how good it is. Yeah, absolutely. And and frankly, I think I, I even get surprised with some of the free stuff that's to offer. Like uh, There's a article for tonight's game on our site written by Mario Puig who you can uh, follow at Rotowire Mario, I believe. Um, and, and he wrote 1,800 words just on the Cowboys versus Saints matchup. These are one of the articles I like to read every single Thursday, if only because I, I value his opinion quite a bit. And I'm not just touting my coworker. I, I really do believe he's one of the best in the business when it comes to this stuff. And he really offers every single possible opinion that you could have on the Cowboys and Saints game or even any team that plays on Thursday and really any direction that those games could go or what fantasy players might go off. I think just about every base could possibly be covered. And these articles are free and they go up every single Thursday based off the game spotlight for Thursday night. So I, I, it's one of those things, again, that uh, Rotowire has so many different things to offer, but we always talk about the tools like the daily fantasy stuff or weekly rankings. And I don't think we give enough of a, a spotlight to some of the writers that do a great job of providing content for the site. So uh, that was my little shout out to Mario and the stuff that he's been doing in the game spotlight. All right, Joe, we'll do it again next week, and uh, hopefully uh, the Bengals do better. If not, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. I'll be all right with it. And if they do terribly, you'll remind me. <laughs> oh, I will remind you, and you can also remind me about how bad the Packers are. I do it enough for myself, but, hey, we can be a pit of misery together as we meet on these Thursdays. That works for me. Good talking to you again, Joe. We'll do it again. <laughs> Sounds great. That's Joe Bardo, Rotowire and Rotowire Magazine. When we come back from break, the best color analyst in all of the Mid American Conference, and maybe a few other conferences as well. We'll find out more with Rob Cornelius about their herd and the Bobcats when we continue with this edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930.
Buckle up. Paul Swan has the wheel on The Drive. ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. We're presented by Belltone Hearing Aid Center here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Always fun for the Thundering Herd to get together with the Ohio Bobcats because, well, one, it's a good matchup usually, and two, they're good people on that side of the Ohio River. And joining us now, one of the real good people. He's the best color analyst in the Mid-American Conference, maybe even in the Sun Belt. I don't know, the Mountain West, you know, two or three leagues, he's probably the best. He's Rob Cornelius. How are you doing, buddy? has already figured out where all their bowl games are. So they're ahead of, like, everybody. They're ahead of Con USA. They're ahead of the MAC. They figured it out. And we're worried about football. I mean, in a week or two, we're going someplace. We have no idea where right now. It's not specifically. Hey, um, right now, Conference USA's bowl picture is partially fixed. You got okay. Louisiana Tech going to Hawaii. Yes. You've got FIU going to the Bahamas. Settled, and that's a fun time. We had the best time there last year. I cannot say enough good things about that adventure. And the Thundering Herds going to their first of two bowls. They're going to the Blacksburg Bowl on Saturday to take on Virginia Tech. And if I weren't busy with basketball on Saturday, I would consider going to that one. That's 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 a good time, and it's what general admission, and it's a cheap ticket. And uh, no, people should go to that. I mean, if they're if they're not going to come to Athens, absolutely get to that game. That's that's a great experience, regardless. So you get Dave Wilson. Um, do you you get him? Do I enjoy? Yeah, instead of Steve Cotton. Yeah. I mean. Is is that um, I mean what's that like? You get Dave Wilson instead of Steve. Steve comes in. He's got he's he's a a major presence. You know, Dave comes sure, in. Sure. He, he's hungry though. I mean, is there any rivalry going on between the announcers? Uh, no, no. But I think I think it'd be fun for for Russ to meet a new guy. Again, Steve definitely owns the room as much. You're right. A much bigger bigger presence, bigger dude. Again, not, most of what I know of Dave is frankly him doing news. I know he's a de facto. Marshall guy, but I know him doing news product in Morgantown. It's actually pretty good in the morning. So I'm cool with him. It'll be a fun time. I wish we could put the whole normal family together, but I'm sure I'll sneak down there and, you know, play Courier games or something later in the uh, later in the season. You guys, it was fun to watch. You guys know I get a free night off here and there and, and come on down, but it sounds like they're a different team this year. Watch some of that Maryland game when they got bombed. Watch and listen to a little bit of that, that William & Mary stuff the other night. Um and I think what stuck out to me is maybe not as defensively up to at least maybe they don't have the shot blocker they had last year. It makes a big difference, you know, not having a cleaner. Those guys in that style can get out and mess around and make mistakes. If you have someone behind you to race them, that's fine. I just don't see Marshall having that yet. This team, you, you can't really think about it because it's not going to happen, but if Ideen Peneva would have come back, uh, boy, oh, yeah. wow, this team would, would be way ahead of the curve. I think what happened with Maryland, this is just me speaking, is um, Maryland just punched them in the mouth. Um, oh, yeah. They knew to probably just go out and just punch them in the mouth. Maryland was uh, bigger, faster, and knew, all right, let's get, get the herd off on their game and came out and just punched them after a certain point. It looked like they were just, I mean, really, just literally and figuratively punching them in the mouth to, to keep them off track. And um, you could tell. You don't feel the, bad about it. I mean, Ohio went over there last year and had exactly the same experience with Maryland. Similar cast of characters. The big Bruno Fernandez kid. They had a couple different shooters that, that graduated that weren't there. But the big picture, yeah, Ohio went over there and just got drilled. It wasn't competitive. Um, you know, at that point in season two where Ohio was starting to crack the early injury of Jason Carter, I don't remember whether he even got any minutes in that game or not. But Ohio was not themselves and got drilled. And I don't think it ever got to 44 or 45, whatever it got to with, with Marshall. But Ohio did not go over there and play well. And that's a different Maryland different Maryland program now. They're much more talented underneath. They actually recruit D.C. They recruit nationally again. And that's actually a really good club. So don't don't feel bad about that one whatsoever. Uh, William & Mary, I thought that was a better team coming in than that record indicated. And mm-hmm. that's the team, of course, that beat Marshall last year. So they, they know they could go in and play the herd. And for a while, it was really close, competitive. It was chippy. And then it seemed like after a while, the Thundering Herd started to pick up the pace. They got really good defensively. Second half, they only held them to 27 points. Uh, John Elmore uh, had a really good night for him. Uh, we were expecting that. He goes over the 2,000-point mark. Only a third player in Thundering Herd history to do that. He was 7-16 of 16 from the floor in that game, 4-8 of eight from the, the three-point line. A little bit more rebounding from him. He had five rebounds. Well, so you know, Elmore's going to Elmore, but I still yeah, say no, he's he's going to be high usage. He's going to get these kind of pile up stats regardless. But it goes to the point that you and I were talking about before we got on air. I think he had a triple double last year in the in the Ohio game, but he was one of the least efficient 
high usage games of the year. For the nerds out there, it was a triple double, but it was how do I say this nicely? It was he maybe held the ball too much. Again, it ended up working out for Marshall in the end. But bigger picture, it's just such a different pace, such a different style. And just like with football, I don't want to use the word waste, but Iowa seems to burn almost one of its best offensive games of the year every year against Marshall in both football and basketball. And I I don't think Saturday would be any different. Ohio's coming off a really big win they needed on Tuesday over Iona, who's a nice club, number two, three, four team in the MAAC, the MAAC, the other MAAC. But it's funny, as badly as Ohio played in Jamaica and as few three-pointers they were hitting, you know, you went and basically won a game by 20-plus, led by as much as 30, and Ohio thought it was a great night to go 7 of 22 from 3. That's 30% from 3, but before that, Ohio was shooting about 8% from 3. So if Ohio is even vaguely warm, they become very, very, very competitive. Um, still kind of a thin bench, still kind of a short rotation right now. Your top two two guards are, are off the floor with injury, and James Gollum and Jordan Dardis, who has been torching Marshall for years, and they'll probably be back maybe into the end of December. Um, but Ohio is not exactly where they want to be at this point either. Rob Cornelius joining us. Um, he uh, is affectionately known as the best color analyst in Mid-American Conference. Uh, covers Ohio Bobcats. Been doing that for a long time. I mean, you're not that old, but yet you're all that I know as far as Bobcat I'm gonna, uh, radio. Well, I'm going to be honest. I mean, the first the first broadcast I was on, and I would do, uh, I was either like the you know, halftime or score host when that was done locally, and then went on the sideline with football in sideline football in like 99 and was on the network in 97, 98. First game I ever worked was 97. So legitimately 20 years in, I need to get some sort of like, you know, bronze watch or, you know, a, a plaque suitable for framing or something. Get a ring or something. Uh, on it, that's, well, that's one they hate to complain, but we, we, we give out mugs when we beat Miami in football. And we have a dozen or whatever mugs, the most recent administration or most of a dozen. Um, but we, we rarely get jewelry. Jewelry is pretty, pretty tightly held now. I don't know how, what the policy is around uh, herd country. We've had a hard time getting our hands on big jewelry, so we take what we can get. Uh, the jewelry for the Thundering Herd's appearance in the NCAA tournament was really nice. I'll say that. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Maybe uh, again, I'm sure Jason Corey or someone will, will, will let us know over there. But uh, no, we're just proud of you guys to do that last year. And you guys know me. I, I work for Ohio, went to Ohio, live in West Virginia, You know, spent more than half my life over here. And just to see Marshall do what they do with a bunch of guys that, not to put them down, but not, not everybody wants. Not everybody wants that style. And not everybody wants those players. And he's taken it. And in the face of some of the rudest things ever said about a coaching hire, he's gotten it done. So I couldn't be prouder of you guys on the other, you know, 29 games a year you don't play against Ohio. I'm proud of that club. So what are we looking like uh, here crowd-wise? We're going to have a good crowd for this one. I know the Herd fans are kind of split between football and basketball, but as far as the home yeah, crowd is concerned. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, midweek I think we announced 5,000. It was it was less than that, probably in the mid-threes. You know, I do the tickets sold versus who's actually their deal. But I think with the uh, Herd crowd, with our students being in, um, coming into the last week, coming into essentially exam week and stuff, uh, I think we'll do a good crowd. I'd say probably I'd like to see seven or eight. That would make me really, really happy. But they should come out and see this. And this this Ohio team, frankly, uh, needs support because this is going to be a tough stretch. Uh, Marshall, obviously, that's a hard one. Uh, you know, Xavier is is next up, middle next week. That's not easy. Um, you've got Radford the following Saturday, who's the best team in a bad league, uh, coming to the convo. And then not long after that, depending on what the bowl, well, the bowl schedule, we may miss it, but uh, Purdue's coming. Uh, we'll show sure Ohio's one of Purdue mid-month in December. So, there are not a whole lot of like obvious slam dunk gimme wins the rest of the month. Florida International at the end of the month, but there's not a lineup of tomato cans from the MEAC or something uh, coming to the convo. So, need this one. Rob Cornelius, our guest. Now, for those who haven't made the trip to the convo in a while, well, just like the Henderson Center, uh, there's some new hardware. Scoreboard's really impressive. Oh, big kids. TV. Yeah. Big TV. Big TV. We do good. And again, and again, it's a really big building. That's a 13,000 seat building. What Hindu is about what a nine right now, 8,500 the way they, they chopped it back up. But it, it's a big enough scoreboard. Um, the old ones, uh, Russ said actually, they set aside, they're waiting to go in my basement, but they're SD. So I'm not even sure why I want them. But no, this big new hanging deal is, uh, is beautiful. It's really, really well done and, uh, let them sell some ads and show us some replays. And, uh, it's a much better package. And thank God TV is way less than they did because that roof would not support a heavy TV. So. Yeah, I'm trying to see some photos now of it and just to kind of get a feel for it. And it fits. It's it's just perfect for the combo. It just it looks – isn't it cool? You know, the herd, bobcats have got these new uh, wonderful bright lights hanging from the roofs. Well, and this is uh, this is we are celebrating 50 years of convo. Um, it's, I think the actual anniversary is during conference season. We're celebrating it by 
playing Akron, our former coach, John Gross, and we're paying up for the Red Panda. So if you're into that lady juggling bowls, um, come on in mid, mid-conference season and celebrate 50 years of Convo Magic. Joining us on the program from the Ohio Sports Network, Rob Cornelius. Uh, the Convocation Center is going to be the place to be for some basketball, that beautiful scoreboard, and probably uh, one of my favorite arenas. Uh, 50 years and going, man. Are you guys going to do anything else to that, that beautiful building? You know, you're going to put some skyboxes in there? What, what, what are you going to do in there? I, honestly, it's funny. That we've taken the, the upper level, the level above the walkway, and gone completely general mission this year because that's such – Catch as catch can in terms of attendance. Like the bottom, you know, the bottom rung is always pretty full, regardless. But you know, it, it turns out that they think they can do better not ticketing the top. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But I don't think there's a whole lot of changes to be made. I mean, they put in new seats uh, a few years ago, so it looks all the ancient ones are gone. It's a better looking building. Obviously, it fixed the lighting up, but it's a great building and it's been well maintained. I think it's going to be there hopefully another another fifty years. I mean, it's so hard on the campus to build anything big because you've got to match architecture. And it's a whole lot more uptight than uh, than the Huntington style. I'll put it that way. So I think Congress has been with us for a very long time, and we're we're thrilled we have it. It's it's a better building than anyone in, in the MAC, anyone in, in y'all's league. I think. I mean, it's it's great building, and we're so proud of it. And hopefully, get another win over you guys. Oh yeah, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I sincerely mean that. Uh, anytime that I get a chance to actually get that way, which is very few and far between these days. But well, you're you're like me. You just wish it had been made a little bit modular. So they could have put a rink in there. We could have done hockey sometime. That's all. That, that's the only thing they didn't do that would have made it better. Yeah. Yeah. Modular that bottom. Get, get by yourself 195 feet for ice, and you're good to go. Yeah, I, I can see that completely. That's what. That's mm-hmm. all I want. Mm-hmm. I just want some hockey. That's yep. it. Uh, we'll yep. s- we'll talk to you soon. Uh, let's hope that the – hey. Done. What appreciate, you- appreciate it, man. I, I, we'll, we'll have a bowl to talk about. You'll have Marshall bowl to talk about. And, you know, I just show up at Huntington sometimes go to cookout and want to see you. So, you know how this goes. Okay. You know what? Maybe the Bobcats and the Hurricane play in a bowl. I don't know. That'd be cool. A to- a totally possible with doubtful. I would say the lead-in two right now are Frisco Bowl. Uh, and by I say Frisco Bowl, that's Frisco, Texas, Metro Dallas, uh, versus one of the teams in the American, like a Houston-Memphis deal. Or back to Boise for a rematch with Utah State because Utah State draws to Boise. Their fans can drive, and they, I believe, are the second best team in that league now after losing to Boise. So, I think those are your two most likely scenarios. Ohio's got the most TV cachet in our league. There's a question of who wants ratings, but I think we'll be playing on Wednesday the 19th, or Friday the 21st, or Saturday the 22nd, which is Mobile. That'd be the three three leaders in the clubhouse. Else, we ship for Detroit Christmas. And, man, you've not experienced anything you've experienced at Detroit Christmas. Oh, isn't it beautiful? The Motor City Christmas. Well, we, we, we went up there and went lost to Marshall under an interim coach, what, eight or nine years ago, and had this been Christmas in Detroit, and that's when the economy was terrible and nothing was open, like just Quiznos, like nothing else. You couldn't even doubt that Detroit was miserable. Worst bowl ever, and we lost. And Rick Minter was still begging for a job. <laughs> Rob Cornelius joining us. Yeah, come back soon, man. We'll talk uh, Bobcat Bowl. We'll talk Herd Bowl. Heck, you know what? We'll talk uh, Toledo and FIU in uh, beautiful uh, Bahamas. We'll do that soon. We'll, you and me, That's we'll fine. break Best, that one down. We'll cover it. Best of luck to Spring Valley. Whatever else is going on, we'll fill the time. Thanks, Bob. Good deal. Good talking to you. That's Rob Cornelius. Uh, Catch up with him on Saturday. You know what? If you go up to Athens on Saturday, just go by the guy and say, hi, how are you? When we come back, we're going to hear a little bit from Jared West. Last night, I had a chance to talk to him after the game. Thundering Herd, victorious over William & Mary. We'll hear that when we continue with this edition of The Drive, presented by Beltone Hearing Aid Center on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930.
You're listening to The Drive with Paul Swan, presented by Beltone Hearing Aid Center on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back. Paul Swan, your host for this edition on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. So, We've been talking a lot of herd basketball. The Thundering Herd victorious last night over William and Mary. I thought that game was really chippy. These are two teams that don't have that much of a history. They they played two times until last night. That's it. Now they played last year and the Thundering Herd got beat. Didn't like the taste in their mouth of that, so they rectified that quickly. I had a chance to catch up with Jared West after the game during my post game. And I was just kind of getting a feel from him, and I asked him, like, you know, this is a, this is a different game. This was a game unlike last year. A lot of scoring last year. Uh, it was a closer game last year. Here's Jared West. Joining me now is Jared West at 11 points in this contest tonight. And Jared, last year you guys had a tough one with these guys, so it was a high-scoring game. What was the difference tonight? It wasn't as high-scoring. Um, Well, I think we just came out very locked in, ready to play early. We knew that they had an efficient offense, and they scored 114 points in us last year. We scored 104, and normally we win those games. But we gave up a lot of points last year, and I think that we came in with a chip on our shoulder. Thinking about that game and our loss at Maryland, I think that was good for us to get going early. But from a defense standpoint, I think we just came ready to play, and we were very focused and locked in early on. We knew they were very efficient offensively, and uh, they make a lot of threes. They shoot a lot of threes. So we knew we just had to come in ready to play. That game felt like just watching. It wasn't – there wasn't a foul fest, but it felt really chippy out there. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. There was a, a couple, you know, chippy chippy uh, fouls every now and then. But I think that that wasn't too bad for us, honestly. I think uh, defensively, I think we did a good job of keeping in front, people in front for the most part. I thought we rim protected very well, and I think that's why our fouls were very limited because we were able to keep our defense set and keep them in front. You like games like this? I know the high-scoring games that fans really like, but this is kind of a this is a Jared West type of game where you get out there, you get 11 points, but you know you're doing all the things that really matter: playing defense, making the other guys uh, throw bad passes, miss. You're just out there agitating. Yeah, I think uh, I, I take pride in defense. You know that, and I, I I do like that type of game, especially when the other team only scores 64 points, and they're used to scoring 80, 80 to 85 points a game. You know, and a very efficient offense. So I think. Um, I, I don't mind those type of games. We still scored our 80, what was it, 84, 85 points. And uh, we just, we, we did what we were supposed to do from a defensive standpoint, and that's why we got the win. Felt good from the three-point line as well. You hit two of five. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. I, I still missed two open ones I wish I would have made. But, um, you know, it, it felt good coming off my hands. I'm, I'm not too worried about it. Coach Dan is instilling confidence in me, and so was uh, all the other coaches and my teammates. So we know we all just got to keep shooting with confidence. Now, this game maybe kind of felt like a rivalry game, but you got a real rivalry game coming up on Saturday with Ohio. What, what do you know about them at this early point? Well, Ohio took us to overtime here last year in a, in a, in a dog fight, so we know that we have to really come ready to play at their place. Um, they got good guards, good bigs. They're very well coached. They're sound on both ends of the ball. So um, we know we got our hands full. we got to come out ready to play early. You like that kind of game with them? Uh, I- fans get into it you know the close proximity it's it's really maybe not your biggest rival but definitely there's a history there yeah for sure I definitely li- uh, like the rivalry aspect of it and I like the, the intensity and heat of that game but um I'm excited for it. our team's excited for it and we know it's a big test for us so we're gonna have to go in there ready to play congratulations on the win thanks man. that's Jared West from last night as the Thundering Herd is victorious over William and Mary, 84 to 64. When we come back, we're going to wrap this one up. It's the drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930.
on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back. Paul Swan, your host for this edition, presented by Beltone Hearing Aid Center. It's Thursday, November 29th. Tomorrow, we're going to have high school football action. Class AA championship right here, starting at 645 on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Saturday, Spring Valley Timberwolves. You can hear them. They'll be on 92.7, 98.5 The Planet. Uh, Spring Valley is trying to bring back a championship home to the Tri-State, so we'll be rooting them on. And then, of course, Thundering Herd on Saturday. You can start your day if you want to hear all your football. Nothing else but football, then basketball. You start your day on 93.7 The Dog. If you want some basketball into your football, you want to hear how the Herd's doing the football, then switch over to the basketball. All you have to do is keep it on ESPN, 94.1 FM and AM 930, and we'll start football. And then we'll jump right into basketball at 3 p.m. That'll be here for you. And then when basketball and football meet, we'll merge. So when football's over, basketball will be going on. We'll merge the broadcast on 93.7 The Dog. So it doesn't matter where you're at. We got you covered. You want to hear basketball or you want to hear football, we've got you covered either way. So there you go. I'll repeat all of this again tomorrow. I will repeat all of this again on Saturday. I will repeat all of this again on social media. And, of course, thanks to my friends at the Herald-Dispatch. You do a great job. They will repeat all this for you as well. So between now and on Saturday, you should know. And if you don't, you can ask me. I'll tell you. So that's pretty much our show here. Tomorrow we'll get you set for your weekend. We've got some Herd and Virginia Tech to talk about as the Thundering Herd making their way to Blacksburg to take on the Hokies. And, of course, then we've got Thundering Herd basketball with Dave Wilson. He'll have the call right here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. And Steve Cotton will have the call, of course, of the football game. And then we're going to wrap it all up. We start our day at 9 a.m. Saturday, Roosters, 9 a.m. Now, Somebody called me today and asked me, hey, how do I watch this game? I said, well, it's going to be on the ACC Digital Network. It's going to be on ESPN Plus, I believe. That's how you get it. I don't think you can get it with just uh, access to ESPN's uh, website without being a Plus subscriber. I think that's what you got to have to be able to watch that. And if that's not the case, somebody let me know because uh, I tried to log in today. Of course, I can't stream anything until Saturday because the game stream's obviously not up. But I just wanted to kind of see what it was going to tell me. But if you have a problem, you can't watch the game. Roosters will have it. I know that. The Marshall Hall of Fame Cafe will have it. I know that. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, Herb will have it at the Union Pub and Grill. And I'm sure you can get it elsewhere if you can't get the game at home. But if you can't watch it, you can listen to it right here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930 with the one stipulation that we're going to join basketball at three. And you can listen to it in its entirety on 93.7 The Dog. Again, I'll repeat all of this tomorrow. I'll repeat all of it on Saturday. It'll be in the newspaper. Steve Cotton will tell you that as well on Twitter. I'm sure. Heard Athletics will tell you. We'll tell you until you know. For our producer, Gabriel Sellers, I want to thank uh, Rob Cornelius from Ohio Radio Network and also Joe Bartle from rotowire.com and rotowire magazine. I'm Paul Swan. This has been The Drive, presented by Belltone Hearing Aid Center on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Good night, everyone. WRBC Huntington. W227BS Huntington. ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Huntington Sports Station.